Noma Hadamai, Ko George Toku Ingo. Um, I'm a structural engineer at Becker. Um, that young fellow over there is me as an intern on my first day back in 2019 uh, when I started as a um, but over in the Melbourne office. Uh, I came across to Wellington about 18 months ago. Um, so I'm pretty new to my structural design and uh, getting better at my sustainability design. I didn't know much when I first started um, coming out of university, but over the last five years, I've grown into the lead of the structural working group. Um, and yeah, I'd like to share my perspectives from a design consultant. That's my point of view from the panel. Um, so that's great. This one. So as I see it, we're leading the design phase. Our opportunity as design consultants is most keenly fe felt because our impact is higher uh, than construction commissioning phases. Uh, the decisions we make um, are locked in and felt downstream of us. So it's our responsibility to recognize the sustainability of performance by design early, to monitor it, and then to deliver a lean product um, for construction. In this talk, I'll, talk uh, I'll highlight some of the focus areas as I see them explore what good sustainability looks like to me, um, pick apart some of our tools that we have available, like our material specification, how we can use that for better carbon performance, and then some practical tips I picked up in my early career that I'd like to share. So the first question is where should we be focusing? We work in a very lean environment where we're not usually given the time of day to think about sustainability. Um, so how do we make effective change as sustainable design engineers and more importantly, what does good look like? What should we be targeting and what's realistic to achieve? But before I get too into it, I might just give a quick overview of what I mean by carbon in buildings. Everyone might not be as carbon literate or um, up with the lingo quite as much as some of the others in the room. So just get us all on the same playing field. Um, I'm primarily talking about embodied carbon on the project. Um, embodied being the built part of the carbon emissions as opposed to the operational carbon emissions. Um, for commercial towers in Wellington, uh, in New Zealand, uh, that's about around the 50-50% mark between embodied energy and um, also embodied carbon and operational carbon. Um, of that uh, embodied carbon, a lot of it lies within the structural elements. Um, what I've got on the right of the screen is a quick carbon count um, and what it's showing as far as the relative proportions of the structural elements. What I'm really driving at is what is the carbon within the structural scope? And where is the potential for carbon reductions within that structural scope that we have influence over? Uh, in short, the decisions we make as structural engineers is hugely impactful for the total carbon of the project. Furthermore, I think we're well placed to offer leadership um, to the wider design team of what the real world implications of lowering carbon is, balancing them things against things like cost, resilience, durability, and constructability, just to name a few. Um, there's a lot of information out there from industry bodies like iStruck D um, that is also applicable for our building reductions in New Zealand. Um, I'd encourage you all to upskill yourself using these forums. Um, the study I'm showing is a parametric study done by Burra Hapold uh, in the UK. Uh, in that, they parametrically design a mid-rise commercial building to see the relative carbon impacts they make by uh, changing their structural design decisions like grid spacing or material choice. Um, however, a unique problem we find ourselves in New Zealand is like uh, other regions that have ambitious sustainability goals like the UK or Europe or parts of the US, um, we don't have good benchmark data to target against and get what appropriate is for our buildings in New Zealand. We could use international benchmarks. However, our situation is quite unique in New Zealand due to our seismicity coupled with the isolation we have as a country for the global material market. I think we should be using forums like this to share some of our LCA results and get a good idea for, as a group of industry peers of what goods looks like for New Zealand and in particular New Zealand. Though this might um, get us a better idea of how those benchmarks line up with our own benchmarks, um, how appropriate international benchmarks are for us. Um, we need to answer the question of how does our seismicity impact us locally in Wellington also as compared to the rest of New Zealand. Um, an important thing is to realise what percentage reductions to a baseline are achievable for us in Wellington. 
um, and what are the appropriate design decisions we should be making for carbon reductions, whether they be partial reusing, innovative structural solutions, strengthening and refurbishment, or approaching it from a non-traditional uh, non structural material like timber. I'm happy to discuss some of these LCA results after the presentation, after the beer, but I won't just keep moving uh, rather than getting really in the numbers. Um, the next one I want to touch on is the power of our specification, uh, material specification, something that's already in our tool belt. So how do we better optimize that for carbon performance? Um, so just to touch on a few um, before we get into that. Um, if you do a quick internet search, um, you'll find probably that every material performs really well environmentally. There's a lot of material lobbyists out there um, that want their material to perform really well because they're selling it. Um, just be aware of it and making sure you're getting your information from good industry bodies like iStruct D or CSOC. Um, so talk about concrete first. Um, imagine you're all pretty well versed in concrete composition, so I won't bore you over that. But some of the particulars to focus on is the cement and steel reinforcing often account for most of the carbon emissions, around 50-50 split between the cement and the steel reinforcing. So cement specification is a particularly effective way um, to lower your carbon emissions. Uh, compression strength is directly correlated carbon intensity. So lowering, the co uh, lowering your specific specification for lower concrete strength will give you a lower ca carbon concrete. Um, you just need to balance things like durability and workability naturally. Um, also be aware of the carbon factors um, that your concrete supplier has. They're not all equal across New Zealand and all the suppliers. Uh, they actually vary quite a bit depending on their manufacturing process and their mixed designs. Um, Portland cement is particularly carbon intensive, which most of you will be aware of. And as design consultants, we've historically been uh, promote, promoting the specification of SEMs or supplementary cementitious material replacements for Portland cement. Um, but I'd rather encourage you to actually ask your concrete supplier, how do you deliver a low carbon concrete mix? Restricting them through SEM quantities isn't allowing them to use the best tools in their tool belt to get you actually what you want, which is a lower carbon concrete, not a fly ash substitute. Agreeing on a verifiable process for the carbon emissions factor uh, when evaluating carbon performance is a really good way to get your tenderers lined up and evaluate them fairly across their mixed designs. Uh, commonly, we do this by requesting an environmental product declaration, which is called an EPD in shorthand, um, from our suppliers. Um, and if your project has a particular high sustainability goal, I'd encourage you to think about the environmental performance specification in your material specification. Typically, we do this by specifying a maximum global warming potential or GWP that the mix can be. Um, we've found this is a very fair way to evaluate multiple tenderers um, for the same minimum environmental performance. Um, as long as you have that verifiable process that you're happy to agree with, um, they won't necessarily need a third party verified EPD too. Um, I just highlight that a lot of this is covered in the recent CSOC journal. Um, so you can read a little bit more about specifying concrete or ask me after. So the next one, steel. Um, again, steel has an equal performance across all steel suppliers um, for carbon. Uh, and again, it largely depends on the manufacturing process and the place where it's, um, where it's being milled and uh, refined due to the electricity grid of the local region. Uh, we recently found on a project that we were struggling to find our 10% reduction until the um, EPD was evaluated for our steel supplier. Uh, the, concrete, the contractor actually came to us with their preferred supplier and typically what we would do early on in the LCA is use an uh, industry average uh, for New Zealand benchmarking. Once you start evaluating that EPD, you can actually compare and actually take your actual LCA results. In this case, we had a lot of well, 1.6 kilometres of UBs, um, so we were able to get a 15% reduction on our steel specification alone. A lot of people are focusing on the concrete specification, but steel is equally important. The main reason for that is the concrete or the contractor had picked a steel supplier who used an electric arc furnace. So we could achieve our 10% goal reduction to get our green star rating um, solely through our steel specification. Timber. Um, so for timber, sustainability frameworks have come a long way as far as promoting the efficient use of timber. 
i.e. reporting the carbon quantities before sequestration is included. Previously, you could design a concrete building, clad it in an enormous amount of forestry certified timber, and then report that you had a net zero building. Not anymore. Um, so sustainable frameworks like Green Start um, require you now to report your sequestration before, um, yeah, so report your sequestration separately to show the upfront carbon, which is the carbon emissions without sequestration included. Um, therefore, it's important to dig into the EPDs, uh, like I'm showing on the page, um, to find the upfront carbon emissions, including shipping, uh, and compare them as far as their uh, manufacturing processes. Uh, so these results are soon to be superseded, not to insult my excellent colleague, because <laughs> they're quite high. <laughs> um, but we find evaluating them on their upfront carbon emissions um, that XLAM and, um, doesn't perform very well, and even the international suppliers, including shipping, don't perform very well. Luckily, though, XLAM have their purchasing uh, renewable purchasing agreement coming through, so hopefully in the next EPD, this drops down more in line with the um, New Zealand suppliers. But last one I want to touch on is a couple of the sustainability impacts that I think we can make in our early careers as structural engineers. Um, so young structural engineers typically aren't given the responsibility for large design influencing decisions. Um, however, I would emphasize that good reduction can be made from small scope items that we do have influence over. Whilst we're often not in the room when the big decision of build or not to build is being made, the environmental considerations of small items is something that we do have influence over. On the slide is one of my calculations and it's a quick and rough carbon calculation which I'm just comparing three different material options for a single flight of stairs. Um, we don't need to get a perfect number when we're doing these kinds of exercises. We're just trying to get a relative number to see if it's actually a worthwhile design decision. In this case, swapping out a traditional material seal, uh, traditional material stair for a CLT air stay, stair showed a significant reduction. Whilst on their own, these material selections isn't going to bring you down to your project goals of 10% reduction or whatever you're going for. However, these items do add up if you are consistent. I'd encourage you to all to consider the material and system substitutions of the design of simple items like purlins, gravity floor systems, and wall panels, as well as stairs, to name a few. Uh, another thought experiment that I've done um, is reframing your design workflow for sustainability allowing sustainability to push you forwards in your design decisions. Um, the example is a ground beam foundation system where you have a grillage of ground beams. And there's, as designers, we have multiple levers that we can be pulling. We can play around with the volume of that ground beam um, to get our uplift requirement performance. We may play with the grade of it to get our durability report, requirement. Um, and we also might play with the reinforcing rate to get our strength requirement. These are all interlinked, however. So what is the most efficient way to design your ground beam uh, for sustainability? So the first ex experiment is to compare volume against steel co um, content for the same uh, strength performance. Through that exercise, you find that volume is one of the key triggers to um, decreasing your carbon, even though it, has, um, it requires you to increase your steel content. Similarly, you can compare grade with durability, um, targeting the same uh, strength performance. So with in, uh, decreasing the grade, you'll have to increase your covers and sometimes increase your steel reinforcing rate uh, to account for that. Again, lowering your grade um, is the most efficient lever that you can have. So you reframe uh, going through that exercise of what's your, now your workflow for the best sustainability workflow for designing a ground beam. The most efficient lever that you can be pulling is your volume requirements and playing around with your volume for your uplift requirement first. Then you go along, what is my um, durability performance requirement? And I'll lower my grade to that. Um, and then doing uh, constructability elements like what is my founding depth? And then lastly, getting your reinforcing rate to um, accomplish your strength requirements. Whilst it's not a perfect example, um, you know, there's a lot of constructability considerations and every project's a little bit different. It just shows you the, the workflow can work. Um, designing for a lean concrete system through a process like this. Uh, the last one I want to touch on is about design conservatism. 
I think it's often the elephant in the room that doesn't get acknowledged enough amongst these industry events. Um, designing to a low utilization to allow for some unknown change in later design stages can often lead to inefficient solutions which perform really badly. As junior engineers, we often find ourselves in these kinds of uncontrolled design stages where we're just going for quite low utilizations without having a really good finger on the pulse of how much fat do I need to leave in my design for later design stage changes. Um, it's important though to be aware of how much fat you have at each stage of your design so it can be eaten into necessarily and removed before inefficient design decisions get locked in. The counter argument of course to this is the resilience requirements beyond the code um, which is very topical with the new hazard model coming up. I'd argue, however, that resilience is gained by clear load paths, uh, redundancy, allowing increased ductility performance, uh, reducing the torsional effects and grid regularity. Designing conservatively using a low utilization is not an efficient way to increase your resilience, especially when you're trying to design a low carbon building. I think we need to accept there's a lot of conservatism built into our building codes which is the acceptable level of risk that our society is willing to accept. Designing conservatively to a low utilization is just building conservatism on an inherent building code, which is built in conservatism. Just one last thought. Um, I think we need to acknowledge that we design in a time of a climate emergency. This means designing for the social and economic factors that we actually live in. Ultimately, I think it's our responsibility that we need to own as structural design engineers. We've learned that our materials and our built environment are precious commodities, so it encourage us all to consider the impacts of our design decisions. Kia ora. I think, are we doing questions now or? That's good. It's a great one to show and it's hundred percent true. So for those who didn't see it, red stag upfront carbon around like a hundred mm -hmm. tons CO2 equivalent per meter cubed or kilograms equivalent per meter cubed, us at like 500, mm -hmm. that is now dropped 200. So it's down to like three something. So that's a function of the energy systems of the countries and Australia has awful energy systems and just runs off coal. So our factory um, until this year was all coal powered. But it's things like this where designers are kicking up and down, screaming, saying, why is your value so high that drives us to change that um, and reduce it? So it's, yeah, an example of positive change. Unfortunately, we've still got brown coal at our uh, mill, sawmill. It's just um, basically at the moment impossible for us to change that. And my understanding is uh, Red Stagger on hydro energy and geothermal um, and in Austria, are they on, um, I think it's possibly nuclear, or at least some of the European suppliers are. Yeah, and so, yeah. yeah, there's sort of arguments either way, but yeah, it's a great thing to jump up and down about, honestly. Cheers. Grab the um. Oh yes, yeah, she's. Uh, we have this microphone. Um, <laughs> that'll do, eh? Um. Sweet. Um, yeah, kia ora. Um, my name is James McLean. I'm the project manager uh, for LT McGuinness on the Living Power project up at um, Calbourne University. I think you were just there. Yeah, so sorry, we're probably going to hear basically the same thing another time, but um, hopefully it's so good you want to come twice. Um, so yes, a, a, a project for Te Heringa Waka. Um, it's, yeah, the Living Power. So just a bit of history about the site um, before we go into what kind of is the key, the two key parts about 
sustainability in terms of this project, which is the living building challenge, then also the mass timber component. Um, no, wrong way. Um, so this is the site. Um, just if you've if any of you've been up to, I'm assuming most of you have been um, up at Victoria University. Just by that little roundabout is where our site is. Uh, it used to be um, this a little, well, not a little, but a, a big gully. And then when they built um, the current Kelburn, um campus up there, they took all the fill and dumped it onto our site, which um, I'll get into a little bit later because that's caused us a whole heap of headaches um, from a geotechnical perspective. Um, there's just another view there, and you can see the townhouses that were. Um, deconstructed um, for that uh, be completely honest there's a little bit of a generous description but they were they were taken down um, to make make way for the living path um, and then yeah those then there just a note um, on a living building challenge building you're not allowed to build on a green field site it always has to be a brown field site um, and the whole idea is that you're um, whatever you're replacing with you're leaving in a, in a better state than before which is really cool and kind of like the whole idea of sustainability um, in many ways, not just um, environmental, but social and economic. Uh, and then kind of the significance of the, of the job, just to give further context, is um, here's a, the whadanui, um that sits behind the living par. This is the first whadanui, um built in a university um, in New Zealand. Um, so it's yeah, got quite a lot of um, cultural uh, history and significance. There's a, oh, that, that's our, um, just a quick image, no, Titan cranes. That's their, one of their first mobile cranes doing a little bit of work there. Uh, and then a photograph of the Whadanui, um coming to completion. So the project team is ourselves, obviously, as the main contractor. Uh, we have Tenet Brown as the architects, Dunning Thornton as the structural engineers, 335, formerly E-Cubed, as the services engineers, Tonkin and Taylor for Geotech, and uh, T-Big are doing the uh, project management from the client side. Uh, so this is the site. Again, um, as we've already talked about, those are the, the townhouses there. I mean, this is an elevation um, from Kelburn Parade side. So the building has 550 solar panels on the roof um, designed to generate 105% of the building's electricity. It also, uh, just down here out of, out of shot, is a wastewater treatment plant, which we installed recently to process all of the building's waste. And it runs on a vacuum toilet system to reduce uh, water consumption. Um, and then we have rainwater retention tanks on the other side of the building. So all of the drinking water is collected from the building as well. So it's designed to be completely self-sufficient. Um, unfortunately, well, I don't know, it's unfortunate or not, but um, for council regulation purposes, we still have to be connected to the grid. Um, but the only reason, if the building does what it needs to do, the only reason why I'd be connected to the grid is to act as a battery to the grid because it's generating too much electricity that than it needs. Here's a cross section through. So um, given the all structural engineers here, just a real quick um, brief summary as to how the structural system works. So it's a two-way moment frame. Um, the moment frames here are not actually in the middle of the building, but they're um, on the kind of the left and right, those um, smaller uh, rectangles. And those are um, where well, the moment frame is made up of uh, two, or well, if you're looking at that section there, two uh, LVL um, 12 meter tall columns produced by Nelson Pine. Um, and then wing beams, we call them, that are collaboration between Nelson Pine and Red Stag, and then uh, columns as well. And then that's all held together with some pretty hefty pins, which we'll um, get into later on. So this is a, kind of an idea, again, a, a blown up image of what the structure looks like. So you can see uh, the T columns that we have there. So those are prefabbed uh, down in Nelson by uh, Nelson Pine and Hunter Timber Laminates. Each column has 1,088 screws in it. Um, and in terms of CNC time, each column is in the CNC for 34 hours. So it's made up of two components and screwed together. And then the box beams, which are the red and the green beams, those are made up of CLT top and bottom flanges and GLT webs. And those are all prefabbed by Red Stag. And then the wing beams, which are the blue things, are LVL uh, webs and a CLT bottom flange. And the LVL was made by Nelson Pine, flown up to Red Stag, prefabbed by Red Stag, and then brought back down to us. Um, seems a little bit inefficient, but that's how it worked out. Um, and then that's what it all looks like if you were to stick it all together and um, make it look like a Lego set. Uh, so so I, just a quick, um, don't worry, we'll get to the sustainability stuff, but you're all structure engineers, so we'll have a, have a wee chat. Here's um, a a schematic, if you will, of the beam column joint. Um, there's quite a bit going on here. Um, back in here, 
So this is the pin that I was talking about before. Um, those pins are 150 millimeters in diameter and they're two meters long and we hydraulically jack them through the column. Each pin weighs about 200 kilos. Then have another pin here that holds uh, dampers. So the whole building's um, got dampers, not viscous dampers, but they're basically just like mini BRBs. And the whole idea is it's low damage design. So you can take the uh, dampers out later on and replace them with new ones after an event. And then out, out of shot is then another column that comes on the outside and there's another pin that goes through there. We, well, this is our biggest concern when we took on the job. Um, Sean McGuinness actually came up to me um, before we got the contract and said to me, James, I hope we don't win this job, but he, here I am. So um, cheers, Sean. <laughs> but uh, we're found from like a tolerance perspective. And as I was saying um, on the Woodworks tour today, uh, we haven't found a single tolerance issue with any of the timber. It is all just slipped together. I mean, touch wood, but it's gone together super easy, which is, um, yeah, kind of a bit of a surprise. I think part of that was we had such a, um, was drilled into myself and the rest of my site team about moisture management and making sure we're super on top of that. And we, are, yeah, very aggressive on clearing water from the slabs, clearing water from the joints, protecting all of these joints that are, really tolerance tight and yeah I mean like putting that first pin in Alistair Kadanak who's from Dunning Thornton and the, well, the lead engineer on that well he's the basically owns the company um came to watch us put the first pin in thinking that there would be a heap of issues and it yeah just slipped in so that's awesome um this is then how the build-up works so obviously we've got some pretty grunty seismic joints that come up from the top of the slab so what we then have is a cradle batten floor that runs on top in, of the CLT, and that's where all of the services run through. So a bit of a confusing thing, but the services for this floor would be coming from the floor above. Um, so you're always looking downwards, so your reflective ceiling plans, also your services plan for the floor below. Um, and that was actually a lesson learned um, for us as well in terms of services and things is everyone gets super excited about CNC and like the opportunities you have with CNC. And I mean, like you guys can um, achieve some pretty awesome things with your CNC. I imagine as can Nelson Pine and Red Stag, but if you want to do all of your penetrations and stuff beforehand, which I think is what everyone reckons is like the way to go, then you're going to have to do all of your services, shop drawings, all of your services design before you start shop drawing the structure. And yeah, that just, um, good luck finding a main contractor that's going to sit around and wait for that to happen. So, um, we have ended up using, we use a total station, pretty similar thing you'd have seen anywhere else. And the total station just locates itself on site and we just go around and um, chuck the tabs down. And then we spent 17 grand on this pretty mean uh, timber coring machine and we just chuck some cores down and hey presto, job done. So yeah, it's worked out really well actually. Um, this then is a bit of a services uh, thing to show you how the building works from an operational perspective in terms of water management. So on the Western side of the site, currently before that was five it's now seven rainwater retention tanks five of those are for um, potable water and two of them are for gray water the gray water then gets pumped back into hanging gardens that hang off the side of the building and then that water is processed through the plants filtrating it and then we lose that water through um basically um it's um uh, what's it uh yeah whatever um coming off the plants anyway Evaporation, that's the word I was looking for. Nice, thank you. Um, <laughs> and then that all comes, that's the water perspective and then the rest of it on those vacuum toilets then comes down to the wastewater treatment plant I was talking about before. And we put that in place um, three weeks ago. There was a super awesome day. We had three mobile cranes on site and our tower crane. It was just like all go. It was so good. Um, and then here's just a schematic of how the vacuum toilets work. I mean, it's can kind of imagine it but it's like you're on a plane or you're on a um, boat um, it just sucks everything up vertically and then the waste is kept in different goosenecks along the way and eventually it finds itself in the wastewater treatment plant and so we use 0 0.7 liters of water a flush which is I can't remember how much actual toilet uses but it's way less and then it also means the wastewater treatment plant has a really concentrated mixture of pill and so huh? yeah they flush up yeah 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 they flush up and so yeah <laughs> it's like flush it flushes up and this schematic doesn't really show it but each one has like a a goose next so you probably don't need to go into too much detail but basically let's say you did whatever you needed to do it would um come up and then it would actually hang up in that pipe and then it would wait for someone else to do something else and eventually it like finds its way to the 
Lou, and it'll be sometimes it'll like sit vertically here and it's just like evaporated, like it's just like suspended in a vacuum and then it'll push its way along. It's a really energy efficient way to move waste through a building. And then here's um, uh, the plan view of all of the solar panels. Um, this has been a thing for us. I mean, we've never done a mass timber building before. We've done a little bit of solar before, but this is proven to just be out the gate complicated. Um, I'd definitely, if you get involved with doing a solar panel design, I'd engage whoever you're, because um, quite often how it actually works is the consultant will specify the number of panels you need and then your subcontractor will then do the design and they end up actually engaging just another consultant. And, and in this case, it turned out the consultant that's designing for us did the peer review on the panels for the 335 and it's all just been a bit of a palaver. But um, we're getting there quickly, but in terms of how that relates to structure and all the different bits and pieces you need on the structural steel and things, it's a, been a huge learning curve and you kind of think you got there and you've got to add more, but it's um, you know, close, which is pretty awesome. So the thing I'm talking about as well was the living building challenge. Um, I won't go into all of it because it's huge and very encompassing. I'm just going to mainly talk about what we as the main contractor have to look after as part of our responsibility. Um, but basically, actually, similar to exactly the same question that George asked before, but literally in, in the living building challenge guide, it's, that question is, what does good look like? And from their perspective, it's these three things. So regenerative buildings that connect occupants to light, air, food, nature, and community. So in the design, you have to prove that there's natural light. Um, and I can't quite remember the percentage, but uh, there's number like a whole heap of different calculations you have to go through to demonstrate everyone's getting natural light. You then have the stuff with biophilic um, interaction. So there's the plants, there's the exposed timber, uh, air. So got a really strict limit on VOCs in terms of different materials we can have on the site. Self-sufficient, as we've already talked about, and they create a positive impact on the human and natural systems that interact with them. Again, coming back to this thing that you're wanting to build a building that leaves the space in a better condition than it was before, and it also doesn't take anything from the community around it. It only gives, hence the um, self-sufficient design. So there's all these, all these different pedals um, that you then need to consider. So place, water, energy, health and happiness, materials, equity, beauty and inspiration. Um, Where's the main contractor? Obviously don't get involved in all of them. Um, we'd like to think we do, but we don't. Um, and then this is just a, a matrix of all the different components that you need to tick off for the living building challenge. So obviously Green Stars are, is a great um, uh, certification system as well. And almost all of our other projects are Green Star, but on Living Building Challenge, all of these things, that new building category, you can't avoid any of them. It's basically zero compromise. You have to hit them all. And if you don't, um, well then, yeah, the clients paid a lot of money for a building that nearly got there, but not quite. So we just can't afford to not do that, but it means there's a lot of work that you've got to do to get to that point. So what do we, um, LT McGuinness, have to look after? So these are the uh, areas we were responsible for. So the red list, um, the red list is a series of chemicals that are not allowed to um, be used on the project. The classic example people always talk about is PVC. Um, we're not allowed to use that on the job because um, there's, um, su there's suggestion that well, studies have shown that it leaches into the ground as it um, is, is used. What, so we use HDP pipe, which is a big change for heaps of our subs. Um, we're not allowed to use uh, copper chrome arsenic for any of our timber treatment, but this is where here is a few caveats that if you can't find an alternative to copper chrome arsenic, for example, timber driven piles, then you have to demonstrate you've advocated to the industry to provide an alternative um, treatment system. Um, in this case, we couldn't find nothing that, well, the only option we had was CCA treated timber piles. And so that's where we've gone with, but we've had to have a pretty lengthy, like tons of pieces of this um, going around demonstrating that we've um, gone out and advocated for better. Um, responsible sourcing. So there's um, certain radiuses that everything needs to come within. The key one for us is the 500 kilometers from site, which picks up Red Stag and Nelson Pine. Uh, living economy sourcing. Um, so that those two things are, are pretty similar to each other. So again, it's um, trying to make sure you're using uh, locally sourced materials where possible. Net positive waste, that's a massive one for us. Um, on average, we need to target 95% waste diversion. 
and at the moment um, if you think about a typical site even a typical LT McGuinness site would be sending off like two three skip bins a day of general waste at the moment we're sending away one skip bin a month so we're it, a, well, yeah, we've, it hasn't been easy, but we've achieved um, at this, yeah, been able to find all these different streams for all these different waste um, products and circular systems and ways to send like, like the treated timber, for example, you can't recycle that in New Zealand. So it gets sent to a uh, golden base cement and uh, as part of their um, energy recovery program. Um, basically they burn the, burn the, t <laughs> the timber um, but then all of the uh, treatments are within that timber then caught um, in their cement process and it's actually put back into the cement so there's no you're not burning it and all of those chemicals are flying into the air it's all caught within the process of making the concrete which is really cool inclusion uh, so it's been uh, one that has not we haven't been able to achieve and I think kind of highlights an issue with the whole industry that part is uh, well, there's part of engaging with apprentices, um, which we can do pretty easily, but the other part is trying to uh, work with 10% of our contracts with Māori-owned businesses, um, and unfortunately just not at the stage where there are companies that can deliver on a commercial scale that we need. So we're partnered with another group called Amatai uh, to try and promote that. And then education and inspiration. So part of that is we have to... Um, induct every single member of the site from the laborers right through the directors of these companies and we had our last induction two weeks ago and had 105 subs come along to listen to myself and my colleague max christian and the client and ewan brown rant on this stuff for um four and a half hours it's like that sort of level of engagement you just don't see on another job and it's yeah really cool to be part of uh so the red list talked about it already there's the chemicals right there um take a photo if you want um there's quite a few of them and the list is constantly increasing and we're constantly having to recheck that everything is compliant and a lot of sites um like the other there's another site up in Ōtaki um who had been doing living building challenge and the plumber snuck on pvc tape taped up all these joins when the site literally stopped for two weeks while the plumber went through and untaped everything and replaced it with compliant um pe tape again zero compromise um Declare, so if you have a declare label, like this is a Timber Labs declare label, then um, you are just red list compliant. We don't need to do any further research. Uh, and then here's a really good example. So when we built our crane base, we wanted to use Denso tape. Everything that's permanent on the, on the project or remains has to be part of the living building challenge, including the crane base. Had to use Denso tape for when you're post-tensioning the anchors for um, when you put the crane on top. Um, and there was one type of compliant Denso tape that we could find. And um, my colleague Max, oh, it's actually not a slide here, but colleague Max went through this massive thing of trying to find where this exact Denso tape was and ended up talking with some guy in some small town in the UK, and he's the original compliant um, Denso tape supplier, and we had communication evidence that we'd gone our way to try to find a compliant. It's just the next level. Um, PVC tape, already talked about that. Uh, and then here's um, our PE uh, retention tanks. So we had to do a heap of geotech work to get these tanks to work. You can get non-compliant uh, plastic tanks, easy as, but these were the only compliant plastic tanks that we could find in the country that also met our volume requirements and had to do a heap of geotech, which doesn't look like much, but this is an absolute geotech nightmare to get this whole thing to work. So you've basically got a massive cut right next to all of your main foundations. Um, yeah headache after headache after headache here's um some hdpe electrical pipe um this stuff is like rarer than hen's teeth this is the last stuff we had in new zealand so we bought out all of the orange ducting supply in new zealand uh, for the project um otherwise you have to get this thing called a a, a um, coil tamer and they use pe pipe heaps on um, big residential like if you're doing a subdivision kind of thing but on our site, we don't have space to roll out hundreds of meters of pipe. So have had to go some extraordinary lengths to find the things that are compliant. Responsible sourcing. So again, um, this is Nelson Pines uh, chain of custody certification. So all of our timber needs to be FSC certified and chain of custody certified. Um, that is not a straightforward process, it turns out. And we've had to advocate to quite a few suppliers to get the chain, a lot of this FSC certified but they're not chain of custody certified. 
and it's proven to them that hey the market is going to start asking you to do this so it is worthwhile spending that 30k but at the moment they just don't see the value it's like the same with an epd that costs um what timberlab was saying to us in epd again environmental product declaration costs them 30 to fifty thousand dollars, and people are starting to ask for it but not everyone's asking for it so it's kind of hard work to get someone to drop down thirty thousand dollars for just one little project in wellington but hopefully this little project in wellington can push them to do even more here's our piles again i talked about those none of, there's nothing compliant about these piles really other than the fact they're timber they're cca they're yeah they're like there's nothing environmentally good about them but again it comes back to that is there actually something that is available um, in the market that meets the living building challenge requirements and the answer is no but we have evidence to demonstrate that we've tried to push the market in that in that direction um so these are if they are fsc certified they are cca treated but they also don't have a chain of custody so there's quite a few different avenues we need to go through to prove compliance cca crop chrome arsenic yeah h5 yeah a part of that also was a piling contractor richardson's drilling um just said they wouldn't sign a yeah, which is fair enough. Wouldn't sign a PS3 on anything other than H5 treated timber piles. Um, and to be fair, if I was them, I'd say the same thing. Um, low living economy sourcing. So again, that's what I was talking about before. Um, just making sure that we're uh, keeping within certain bands uh, to procure material. Here's uh, the first element of one of the columns down in Nelson Pine. So again, heaps of our, everything's by cost, by the way. So um Fortunately, all of our timber suppliers within that 500 kilometer radius, so it makes it not too hard. Um, and then that's one of the columns um, getting, yeah, prefab. And that's one of, I think his name is Andrew. It's like Andrew and his son, I can't what his name was, but these two absolutely massive South African guys. And they were just smashing out screws like nobody's business. But um, the first two columns took like four weeks. And then by the, t by the end of it, we were had, had the opposite problem of too many columns. So just probably like one yeah a week and a half to put all the screws in again 1088 screws just to forgot that number um here's then red stag um that's reza don't know if any of you have met reza before yeah if you've met reza um super nice guy this is the test beam that we had to do for the box beams um to do a long-term deflection test as part of our peer review um so myself and rowan bella who's the structural engineer on the project flew up to help them get this all ready um this has been a huge learning curve for Red Stag. They're in the business. If you've been up to their plant, be the same with um, Exlama. Yeah, um, is you're in the business of producing timber. You know, you don't want to be. You want that CL that CLT. I mean, the CNC machine to be moving at pace. And then these guys from Wellington come along and ask them to make. For you, it's kind of hard to tell, but all the lamina are slightly different thicknesses. So you've already lost an efficiency there. And then also need a prefab. So it's been a big learning curve for them. They, for a time, were telling us to never do prefab ever again. But again, like Nelson Pine, they've just been pumping this stuff out. like, And it's super high quality. Like the quality is probably better than the first ones. And they're now saying, yeah, actually, we are open to doing prefabrication again, which I think is awesome. It's particularly um, timber double T's. That's like, should try and get those in all your jobs. They're so good. And that's a finished box beam um, up at Red Stag. So those things weigh about five ton or something like that. And um, they are slot on these years. Um, here's the foundation. So typically on a construction site, um, you would pour a tidy slab before you poured your foundations. There's no tidy slabs on this job to try and minimize concrete. And then all of our pile caps, these funny um, eye shapes, but it's not quite true. This, there's a, piling story which you can talk about another day because we won't have time but everything's designed to try and reduce the amount of concrete that you're using and then all of these then get backfilled uh, just with ap65 and just compacted in layers and then here's a yeah pretty mean this is probably my favorite photo one of my favorite photos of the job is the tower crane taken in one of the double t floor units into place and that's it getting landed there and there's Japet, uh, absolute legend foreman who's like the guy leading the um leading the uh, install of the timber and he's absolutely smashing it net positive waste so these are waste diversion waste diversion targets that we need to hit um, some of them are pretty easy like metal and paper I mean if you're not doing that already then what are you doing 
Um, soil and biomass, that's a really tricky one. So we've excavated just over a thousand cubes of fill um, from the site and all of that has to be diverted to another project. It can't go to landfill. So we've fortunately had a land development job in Oharu Valley um, where we've sent a lot of the fill and it's been used to fill in valleys so they can build um, build houses around there. Um, but then a couple of times the site's literally stopped for a few days because we have so much dirt that means we can't move anything and we haven't um, had a place to take it. So fortunately through all of our networks and uh, T-Bigs networks and stuff, we've always, from every now and then, like sent out some help calls and someone always has a mate that needs some dirt. So um, it's worked out well. Um, and then, yeah, probably that, that's the other key part is all other combined weighted average is 90%. And we have to record all of our diverted waste. So we have to weigh everything. And we've got heaps of offcuts and stuff. And we've got a little recycling yard up at the side if any of you want some timber offcuts or anything. And we've got some cattle scales. And we just need to weigh it, take a photograph. And then you need to send us a picture later on with evidence that you've um, actually used that waste for something. It's like, again, it's like next level. But it's pretty cool. Um, this is humble beginnings. This is humble as um, that's in front of the Fatanui. Um, that's on site, so we build around the Fatanui, which is very cool, but also pretty crazy. Um, this is where we started, and now we've got. Um, I mean, it doesn't look sexy, but does it really? I mean, skip bins. Um, but all these different bins now that we've got um, more of the build. It's quite an old photo, obviously, but now we've got wheelie bins everywhere for all these different types of offcuts. We've got bins for sabre seal pipe tubes we've got bins for hdp offcuts we've got bins for jib we've got you name it we've got it we've got a bin for everything um and a lot of the stuff we haven't figured out where it's going but um max my colleague is doing an awesome job at trying to find waste streams for all these places to go oh yeah and there's um well there's a uh, chainsawed out um living par um bike rack on our cattle scales heaps of our piles we've diverted 22 tons of pile offcuts from the site um, a lot of them we've actually used for lagging for that rainwater retention tank area, but then we've also sent a lot of them to Muckata Mountain Bike Park for um, their jumps track. So if you're into mountain biking, check it out. Um, oh, there's me on an electric bike. Um, <laughs> uh, and then this is the <laughs> mill down um, timber offcuts um, that we've used. This, this stuff isn't treated, and this the guy who did all the milling for us is now reusing that for um, all sorts of bits and pieces, which is really cool. Really nice timber, actually. Um, and yeah, his collection of treated timber. Inclusion, so amortize, I mentioned before, um, working with them, they basically collect together Māori owned businesses and help them um, get into projects with LT McGuinness and things. And then the another part is just, so we personally aren't doing one of these, um, but Tenant Brown, this is their one, the architects, and it's basically you have to answer a series of questions and get your staff to talk about their feeling of, inclusion and um, representation in the company I and mean, that basically gives you a, a a certification of how socially just you are um yeah like for example we would do really poorly on the gender diversity thing which is um not the reason why we're not doing it but it's a it's pretty can be quite a confronting thing to realize what parts you're doing right and what parts you aren't doing so right uh, and this is a really cool thing this is so we got a university student called Hui. Um, he's come up and he's painted um, a lot of uh, Maori gods around our um, smoko facilities. Um, so another big part is um, we've got a lot of different cultures on our site. Um, Maori, um, we've got this is two. So he uh, is the Marae manager. Uh, this is Leslie. She um, is one of our uh, dogmen, um, and her and two are both from Tuhoi and actually grew up together. And both their first language was Te Reo Maori, which is Really cool. So they speak a lot of Tadao Māori on site. Um, this is Japet, who I was talking about before. Absolute legend. This guy is such a good dude. Um, oh, Filipino Tagalog. And so our health and safety video is bilingual. Um, so the guy's talking Filipino, uh, Tadao Māori. Uh, this is Tini talking in Samoan. Um, but a big part is this broader outcomes idea and trying to increase representation and celebrate that stuff. So last week we had a had a hungi um, to... Um, celebrate Tiruiki Te Reo Māori and oh it was just so cool um, and our client came up and had a chat to us about um, the kind of how the living building challenge relates to Te Reo Māori um, and taught everyone a few little bits and pieces around um, just in increasing their knowledge of why the project is what it is 
Um, and then, yeah, education and inspiration. So these are, um, are broader outcomes, um, objectives that we wrote at the start of the job and we're contractually, there's a whole heap of um, points that go below these and we're contractually obliged to hit all of these targets. So there's a heap of things that sit below here of different um, objectives that we're going to do on the job. And it's this isn't just like nice airy fairy stuff that looks good in a tender. This is like, you have to do this. And we get brought up in PCG meetings. How are you guys tracking against these things? Because yeah, we're paying you money to deliver this. Um, now here's just a few photos of how the power is going. They're a little bit, I mean, the timber's just flying up like nobody's business. So they're a little bit outdated, but um, some cool things to see. That's photo of my colleague being the site manager, just looking up at the first floor slabs we put in. Here's us standing one of the timber columns. So we're trying to minimize the amount of um, temporary fixings we use. Um, so the only place where we drilled in is four anchors or four bolts for a propping. Otherwise we use the damper um, pin connection to pivot the column up into place. And then that just lifts up and we slot it in. We were using those props to write or to plumb the column, but found that's just a bit too slow. So we now hang ropes off each four sides. I don't know if any of you are sailors or anything, but it's like putting up a mast and adjusting the stays uh, to get it nice and plumb. And so we, First column we put up took us two and a half hours. We're now at about 30 minutes a column, which is awesome. You'd be a bit shocked if that wasn't the case, but still sounds good. Um, and here's Marcel, our crane operator, just down below the column as we lift it up. Here's the B5 um, wing beam I was talking about before this, so the first one we put in. So that slots in around the column, and then we uh, jack the pin through. Um, the tolerances and that water management stuff you can see up on the columns here, how we've got little hats on top of all the columns to minimize um, any chance of the LVL expanding um, during before the erection. And again, as I said, like it's all gone together really well, which is nice. So B2 beam, these are a bit tricky because they knife around the column. They don't just slot in, so you can't just bring the beam in and just slot it in. You've got to put it on a 20 degree pitch, bring it in, and then put chain, we've got chain blocks on there, and then you drop it down to then fall into position. And that's the team just mucking around with the chain blocks, getting it in. And here's a couple of shots of our wastewater treatment plant, um, which is installed now, but just all the digging and the piling going around there. And this is the um, lift shaft that we put in place. Those came as four 12 meter tall CLT panels, and we built a lift shaft in a day, which usually takes like two weeks. So again, like there's massive efficiencies that you can achieve from timber. If you do it right and you look after it and you don't let it expand, um, and there's just a shot through there, another shot. It's a pretty cool day. Um, and there's up through the thing, but um, yeah, Tenakoto, thank you very much. Um, it's a bit of a fly through. Um, we've got there'll be lots of opportunities coming to the past if you're keen. Um, just jump on one of the mini tours that are happening. And yeah, thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, the LVL comes painted um, with a product called Equience um, that has like a six month um, durability, um, but it's not really, it's just more of a UV kind of protection. It's slightly water protective, but we then paint the topping grains with another product called Fortitude 150. That's a hydrophobic um, clear coat product. And that's worked really well at keeping water away from the end grain. I get this isn't the point, but... um. How much, what percent increase was this compared to a standard steel or concrete building? And then if you were to do this, another project exactly the same with the same mm. team afterwards, mm. how much do you think you could drop that down by, you know, without, there's been a lot of stuff you would have experimented with. Interestingly, um, so for complete transparency, the job started off at 38 million. It's now at 54 million. Um, a big part of that is to do with the piling. Um, so I touched on that very quickly. Um, the piling is all timber driven piles other than in a few locations and the rock level is was just completely all over the place. Like for example, we drove a 11 meter deep pile, um, lost it 13 and a half meters into the ground. So it actually went below the pile mat. And then we drove another timber pile a meter away from it and only went in seven meters. So I'd probably I'd replace the piling system um, in terms of cost of that 54 million, the contract with Red Stag 
was $1.4 million. And the uh, Nelson Pine contract was just over a million. So I think that perception that timber is more expensive than steel and concrete is um, not saying that's what you're saying, but I think it's just, it's, it's not correct. Um, and I think people price it out because they're nervous about working with timber and about all those issues I talked about before of it not fitting together properly and all those sorts of things. But I mean, we're living par has been our first mass timber job. We've now got 90 Devonport, which is a eight story tall LVO and CLT building that's going together really well. Like we're growing confidence in it, you know? And so I think the price is going to reflect that, but on the, you couldn't really compare the only way you could ever compare this job to another job is if it was also going for the living building challenge because you have that part and then also the wastewater treatment plant can't go into the numbers unfortunately but it blew out massively and if you were to look at where the variations have come from from 38 to 54 million most of it is in the piling and the wastewater treatment plant and then a few additional screws here and there from the peer review so it's probably another thing just to note what's been a real challenge we found on the par and also Devonport is peer reviews dragging on for ages and ages and ages. Um, and there needs to be a bit of a, a change there um, because I don't think the peer reviewer necessarily understands the delay. Like, yes, we've got to solve the problem correctly, but the delays and the cost that it has to the client is, um, I don't think that we're having that conversation correctly um, and we need it. Obviously, we want to build a building correctly, but we don't want to have that the cost of the client, which in our case has been yeah millions of dollars. I'm not saying it's all the peer reviewers' problem, but you know, yeah. When you say peer review, uh, do you mean structural peer review? So this building shouldn't be built until it's been signed by the peer review, and I believe the peer review. I know who the peer review is that. I, yeah, I know who the peer, yeah, the old I work colleagues. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's been it's been it's been a challenging it been a challenging one. What we I I agree with the point that the peer review shouldn't be continuing on while we're in construction. Um you should I mean that should all be sorted out well before that happens. Um but in our case we and in the case of Devonport as well have been doing the LVL shop drawings while the peer review is still happening. And in another case, part of the building wasn't designed. So we've designed part of the building and then are still waiting for a peer review for that part of the design to be completed so we can complete that element. Um, like the peer review is also in, in a tricky place where it's um, very complicated. The council, I don't think, properly understands timber buildings either, really. Um, and so relying a lot on that peer reviewer and the designers. But yeah, it is mainly the structural part. Um, I do take your point that we shouldn't be building um, before then. Um, but also, you can't... There's like commercial realities, you know? The cl a client has built or purchased a, a building. They've said they're going to start building on this date. And the peer review can't just have a... Just can't go on forever um, because, yeah, just, I mean, there's other factors at play. The the second one, you are using LVL or cross banded LVL? Just LVL. Just LVL. We were going to use cross banded LVL on the roof, um, but it was really hard to get the structural numbers out of Nelson Pine to justify that it could be used for the roof diaphragm. Thank you. Weird flex. Um, what were those waste numbers again that you thought a usual product or project would be in the county? Or am I going to zoom, zoom back? Awesome. So it was, yeah. you, you mentioned like one skip per month compared to. Yeah, we have one general waste skip and leave the site a month at the moment. Yeah. Compared to. What were you three per day or so on a when you get into like big fit out, it's usually like three to four skip bins a day. Um and before then it can be yeah, two to three. So mm. do you have a feel for so generally I think timber projects have a bit less waste because there's that off site manufacturer, not as much yeah. cutting there. Mm. How much do you feel was that compared to all these waste streams that you also managed to implement? 
Yeah, well, it's steel. I think the biggest waste from a steel and concrete building would be all of the concrete um, over pour, um, really. Um, yeah, none of the timber, that's the thing that the guys have said without even being probed is going, oh, wow, like this building compared to a steel and concrete building is like so nice and clean and quiet to work in. There's no Rio scrape along com floor. The screwing's really quiet. You're not putting in big rattle guns to do... Um, bolts up and things um so yeah i think probably the biggest amount of waste we've had has been that biomass part and then if you were to go into looking at cost it has worked out cheaper to divert the fill from landfill than to go to landfill because you're still paying the shipping fee but you're not paying the waste fee as well because people are taking the fill for free on the condition that we um ship it out to them and maybe give them a digger for half a day to move it around um same with the treated uh, timber my colleague again max has done the numbers on it and it's cheaper to divert the tonnage of timber that we have and pay for the shipment to go to Fongaday and convert it into energy than it is to just send it to landfill and then you're also taking away that part of the t treated timber leaching into the ground later on mm. so i think the numbers stack up really well it's just you have to have the infrastructure to make sure it works and auckland's probably the best suited for it with green gorilla um and here in Wellington, it's a bit of a mishmash kind of method, but yeah. Sorry. Um, are there any sort of practices as a as a main contractor that you can see taking forward on future projects, even if not a, a living uh, building challenge project? Yeah, I think um, going to P P pipe. That's going to be a really big one. And we're seeing, starting to see quite a few jobs move to PE pipe on that environmental perspective. I think this waste stuff, we've um, found that that's not actually that hard um, to do. Not probably, to, we wouldn't ever do it to this scale, but in terms of diverting and sorting out rubbish, it's not as cost prohibitive as we thought previously. Um, and then the other one would be this red list. And it's not really us, but it's our subs, but having forced them to go out and try and find red list compliant products and realize that those red list compliant products, I mean, not every case, but a lot of the cases, they are cheaper um, or cost comparable and have that added environmental benefit. And so a lot of them are already going, oh, far out, we should just use that on all of our projects. Um, yeah. I'd, I'd imagine that the the whole process has given you exposure to materials and products that you didn't probably, you know, didn't need to oh, look, look for. Yeah, you know, absolutely not. Today. Like probably the craziest story is um, the insulation on the building is called rock wall. Um, we had a red list compliant product. Um, then the supplier, I won't say who they were, but I think tried to, but all the rock walls look the same, but it turns out they're all, if you read their um, EPD, their EV is so slightly different, particularly on the formaldehyde content, which is quite a big focus for living building challenge. Um, they try to sell us another one, which we did. Again, you've got to like almost double check everything beforehand um, to a certain extent, trust no one, you know, um, and found out it wasn't the compliant one. But then the compliant one during this time, the Ukraine war started and the compliant product was made in Russia. Now we've obviously got to trade. We can't get anything from Russia. So now we've had to go through a three month process to find another compliant rock wall. Um, so yeah, it's, um, those parts we probably won't miss not having to do that level, that level of research. Um, but again, that's kind of the purpose of the PAR, right? Is it's not, it's being made by a client that's not commercially driven. They're kind of more socially driven and the hope or their hope is that people will take these opportunities and roll them onto other jobs. And to a many extent, that's like the, the bigger challenge for us, even bigger than the living building challenges. I mean, we could finish this job, go and do another, do another um, hundred million dollar, um, apartment complex for some big developer and just go oh that was like that was a nice three years you know we cared about the planet and then we just don't care anymore right. so like the big part is making sure we roll that out on all of our other projects mm. cool How's that?
Hey everyone. Um, I'm Kieran. Um, as Harrison said, I'm a structural engineer by trade. Uh, worked for six or so years. Got to work in some pretty cool timber jobs, which was nice. Um, and now I've moved across to a, a broader technical role at XLAM. Um, so it's got this inward facing side with product development um, and outward facing side, helping anyone to use the product. Um, but it is really cool role I find because I get to see timber all the way from its log as it's coming out of the forest with our now owners hind all the way to kind of final certification on site. Um, and so I do the clicking. Just very quickly who we are. So XLAM um, were founded in New Zealand about 12 years ago, uh, about eight or seven or eight years ago, Hine, who are a sawmiller in Australia, bought XLAM. Um, and it just made sense because they have their own sawmill and their, their timber stock to build a new factory right next to that source. So right now the factory is in Albury, Wodonga, which is about 50 kilometers from the, the forest there. So that just reduces all your transport and everything. Um, but because of our New Zealand presence, we've still got a heap of staff here, actually more than in Australia. Jordan's one in Wellington, Paul at the back, crept in when I was in here. Um, and we've still got this kind of, so that's our main factory in, in um, Albury. We've got this post-production facility in Auckland. So another just big warehouse where we're able to do some post-processing work, possibly things like double T beams, um, but no promises yet to talk to Jordan. Um, and I don't think this gets enough sort of media, but because it surprised me, we've now done over a thousand projects in Australia and New Zealand. I don't know, when I joined the timber industry, I kind of thought there were under a hundred. Um, so there are a lot out there. They just sometimes don't get too much media. Um, we've learned a lot through that whole process. Just to make it a hundred percent clear. So we make, I know some, I mean, at least when I was a designer, I had never seen CLT. I like held it. So this is CLT, this is a three layer panel. So um, got boards at the top running in one direction, then um, generally you'll have alternating 90 degrees per layer. So the second layer running the opposite and then this bottom layer running again. So it'll have its primary direction of span, which will be a bit stiffer. We'll have some stiffness in the other direction, um, but that central layer, people think it is to get that two way strength. It's actually mostly for um, stability from moisture related movement. So timber shrinks a heap perpendicular to grain, not much parallel to grain. Uh, so that restrains that movement. If you didn't have that, say you just had all boards in the same direction, you get, uh, I think you can get like 30 mil of movement over a 10 meter width. So if you put them as your floor slabs and you get that sort of gap opening up, it just isn't feasible as a product. Um, so that's where these work really well as floors and walls. Um, so I pass it around and you can have a feel. Um, but yeah, I'm going to talk a bit about why, go very high level, why choose timber, but I'll go focus on the sustainability side. Um, so as designers, engineers, architects, builders, uh, generally in the past have judged jobs on time, cost, quality. We're seeing a lot more lately carbon and safety come into that matrix. Um, and then you could break that down even further and uh, your project might be judged on your operational embodied carbon. Um, client might be interested in biophilia uh, aspects, the aesthetics, durability. Uh, they might be yeah, really hinged on cost. So then spans come into it. But at the end of the day, as designers, we're just trying to pick the best material to fit those requirements. Um, and so there might be some jobs where timber doesn't stack up. Concrete might be a much better solution, say durability in the ground generally, unless CCA wouldn't want to use your timber. Um, there might be some instances where it's on a sort of leveling pl level playing field, it's other materials, but there genu genuinely will be some areas where timber is a better option than other materials. So as a designer, I just think it's super important to have it in your tool belt of, of options. Um, some of those some of those examples, I won't give project examples of this presentation, but time of construction, um, lightweight, reducing your sort of foundations if you're in poor quality fill, that sort of thing, it can make a project viable that genuinely wouldn't be, or we've had some that wouldn't be in other materials. Um, the big one, one that has motivated me to get where I am and um, also to see other people with the same sort of motivations here in the room is the sustainability side. So we heard that buildings, massive part of global annual emissions, 39% around the world. 
and embodied emissions are a huge part of that uh, at 11%. Um, and so when we just compare two common construction materials, concrete and your CLT, I've actually still got that as minus 492 with that. I'll have to check that whether that's updated or not, but there's a huge difference. Um, these numbers I feel don't mean a whole lot to a lot of people. So I'm going to break down how I got a real good understanding of this um, and hopefully it'll help. Um, seems very technical, but bear with me. Um, so to make concrete, you use your sand, your aggregate, water and cement. Cement's the bit we, we care about. It's all these bits in cement. Basically, that's just limestone um, and clay. Um, and limestone's our issue here. So limestone, we dig it up out of the ground. Limestone has been forming over billions of years in the below the earth's surface. Um, and if we look at the chemical composition of limestone, it's CaCO3. What we do to make cement, heat it up super hot, 1450 degrees Celsius. That's the first issue because those temperatures are very hard to create without um, fossil fuels at the moment. Um, but we do that so that we take out the lime and the lime is basically your cement. And the chemical formula of that is CaO. So those who are cluey chemists in the room will notice the thing that's missing is CO2. So during that process of just breaking down limestone to cement, CO2 is released. And at the moment, there's no way to capture that as that happens. So that side of things, they estimate is around 4% of emissions for, for concrete. Um, and the other side is the, the heating and the transport and those sort of things. So together, sorry, that 4% number is part of a 8%, which is a portion of global annual emissions um, for concrete. So yeah, 8% of global annual emissions are due to concrete. Um, steel, I won't go through the, the whole process with this, um, but also a very energy intensive process, also associated to a lot of emissions. Iron and steel are 8% of global annual emissions. There are better options out there, um, like using arc furnaces to reduce those emissions. Um, but together, 16% of global annual emissions, other than your energy um, market, this is kind of the next big kettle of fish. And it's huge when you compare to things that get a lot of media, like um, the airplane uh, travel industry, it's only 2% of global annual emissions. But when we look at timber, we flip that whole chemical, chemical equation on its head. So trees when they grow they suck in carbon dioxide they combine that with organisms from the or nutrients from the ground and sunlight to create a tree um, and a tree in its dry weight is just 50 percent carbon um, so it's locked up stored in there as you as you put it in your building so not only are we avoiding a carbon intensive material going with timber we're also picking a material that is absorbing carbon as it's produced so the big key thing about this all obviously um, is that the timber needs to come from a sustainable forest. So what that means is every time a tree is cut down to, to make these, a new one's planted in its place. If you're not doing that, it's just about the worst thing you could use because you're taking a carbon soaking uh, thing out of, the, out of the world. But if it is, then you actually get this rotation where you end up soaking up more carbon. Um, so most of your timber in Australia and New Zealand will be certified. So New Zealand has FSC certification. In Australia, we have PEFC. They just uh, prove that you do that with your forests. So for me, again, that still doesn't mean too much with those numbers often. So this is just to put it in perspective a little bit. Um, on the y-axis there, tons of CO2 equivalent. Uh, first figure there is your CO2 absorbed per tree per year. So it's about 19 kilograms. So 0 0.019, so not showing much there. Um, a flight from Perth to London. Anyone want to have a guess of how many? First number that comes to head. 4,000 here and 4,500. Kilogram though, 1.5 ton. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, so all around the ballpark, 4,500, 4.5. It's at about three. Um, a meat eater's diet, quite similar at about three per year, 3.4 tons CO2 equivalent per year. Um, a vegan diet, 1.5 kilograms CO2 a year. So um, so I pivot my presentation to convince you to go vegan. Um, but then if we get into uh, 
buildings. So a thousand meter squared concrete floor plate. So this is just assuming a, about a nine by six meter span. Um, so a thousand meters, hundred meters long by 10 meters wide. Anyone have any guesses um, on that quantity? Oh, he's clear. <laughs> yeah. What do you reckon? How how far up? Three from five. <laughs> I did trick you. This oh sorry, these are my metrics to keep everything in perspective. Um yeah, the scale needs to change. Um and it's all the way up at 58. So that's just your thousand meter squared floor plate. Um if we instead look at glue lamb, seal thin glue lamb. You have to change the scale again. I like to set people up for failure. Um, it's all the way down at negative uh, 130. So for me, this is not to say let's ignore going vegan and all those things. There's a cumulative impact that can happen with those sort of activities that are awesome. Um, but it also shows that designers, uh, building designers, have a um, huge responsibility or ability to affect change in this respect. Um, and to go even further, Google HQ, I don't know if you've seen it, but an absolutely insane building. Its total carbon was 30,000 tonnes, which is almost as much as the whole of the Cook Islands per year. So there's a lot, a lot of emissions associated. <laughs> um, but into some structural design principles, wanted to bring a bit of a, um, just a few high level tips of if you're designing with timber CLP mostly, uh, specifically in most cases. Um, so where is our CLT used? This is a plot from the US of uh, on the left axis or vertical axis number of buildings built and on the X it's from 2000 to 2023. So number of mid-rise timber buildings. And we've just seen this exponential increase. Uh, and this has been much the same in Australia and New Zealand. This was just the, the best data set that I could find. So mid-rise is, we find the most common use case. It fits into this nice area where uh, CLT especially is used to a good capacity um, and there's reduced fire regulations before you get to certain heights. But there are other places to use it. You can use mass timber CLT in houses. Uh, you could use it in industrial situations. These are CLT shear wars, but glue lamb, trust roof. Um, you might be able to use it in high rises. Looks like this one's, or well, this one is going ahead. So this is a, the Atlassian building in... Um, in Sydney, they've got a pretty creative solution to the fire requirements. What they're doing is creating a concrete mega floor every five floors. So it's like this massive thick concrete area so that they separate each fire compartment between those floors. And then they're building a timber habitat in between each of those um, levels. Um, yeah, time will tell if we keep doing these sorts of things. I've got a feeling at the moment they're a bit of a showpiece for timber, which is good to kind of get the word out there, but we might fall back to its um, lower height use case in most instances. And we also see a lot in feature elements, uh, particularly roofs because of reduced uh, loading and um, fire requirements often uh, or concessions in those, in those spaces. So this is, you recognize that roof. You'll recognize that roof, fish market roof. Very good. Um, so next big principle, uh, it's really important to design you lay out to the strengths of timber. I don't, we don't see this so much anymore, but we would like a couple of years ago, all the time, get someone bring us their concrete building and say, oh, can you give us a timber scheme for this building? And you just up against it. It's never going to work. Um, it's a completely different material. It's efficient at different spans in different use cases. Um, and it gives a kind of wrong perspective to the, to the client, I think. Um, and so the key thing there is that CLT is cost effective at shorter spans. So up to about six meters is where we see it. Most cost effective could go up to your sort of seven to eight meters with just your solid panels. Might be able to get into your rib deck products or T beams if you go further than that. Um, it's good to avoid load transfers. Timber has uh, it, this tendency or uh, property where it uh, follows creep deflection. So if you put a dead load on your beam in bending, if it deflected 10 mil um, under dead load, over 50 years, it would deflect another 10 mil. So it'd be down at 20 mil. Um, so you can understand you don't really want to be putting columns on those bending members because otherwise if your building drops 20, 10 mil over time, you're going to get all sorts of issues. So timber, we like to keep our load paths aligned. If you need to do sorts of transfer elements, things like that, you might be better with steel or concrete in those instances. 
Um, designing for one-way spanning systems can be a good method to increase your robustness um, in cases of losing elements. And then uh, it's, it's good to understand the building typologies that suit um, certain building types or timber systems that suit certain building types. So this is just a simple example, but the one on the left here uh, is a residential building apartments. They've got their walls. So it can tend to uh, lend itself to a, what we call a honeycomb structure. So CLT walls, CLT floors. Um, if you're in a, on the right, Darumu house in, in Sydney in a commercial setting where people want those open, open layouts where they can see across the office, it will lend itself probably better to a post and beam solution. So that's glue lamb or LVL columns and beams, CLT slabs. I'm going to touch on DFMTA. So that's designed for manufacture, transport and assembly. Uh, this is just an awesome thing to have in mind when you're designing because timber is a manufactured product. Um, it needs to be transported to site and the quicker you can assemble it, the cheaper your build will be. Um, and the higher quality. So some key things on the manufacturer side, uh, I'd straight away, if you're um, not aware, try and find videos online of how the products are made that you're specifying. We've got a video that uh, Wood Solutions go through our plants, like an eight minute video, go through every single step of how the billets are actually made. I think that's super important because until you, if you don't understand that, it's very hard to understand the limitations on what you're um, say cutting into the panel uh, the sizes you're making, things like that. Um, I'd also recommend getting in with, uh, getting in touch with suppliers as early as possible to understand those constraints. Um, yeah, just reach out to all of them. We're always open for anyone asking questions. Uh, that's kind of my job. <laughs> so you need to keep me employed. Um, <laughs> the next awesome to have as big panels as possible. Um, that just means less lifts in the factory, less QA checks, um, leads to a more efficient cost-effective building. Uh, understand your tolerances and tooling. So what tools we have in that video, we'll show you all the tools. We've also got a tech note, which shows the saws and the drill bits and everything, um, but we can cut those all to plus or minus two mil tolerance. Um, and where possible, avoid panel flipping. Uh, what I mean by that, it's not as big an issue anymore, but if you say have a drill hole on the bo bot know, bottom and top of a panel, um, you would have to take it out of the CNC machine, flip it over, put it back in the CNC machine. Uh, it doesn't seem like much, but they used to take us about 20 minutes. We've now got a panel flipper, which has brought it down to seven minutes, but this is a manufacturing um, industry. So the more output we can get, the cheaper everything is. The transport uh, side, it's important to understand your transport limitations. Um, for example, if you're getting stuff over from Europe, they're constrained to the container size that they can fit it in unless they get super creative fish markets that uh, bring it over in an open deck, 38 meter long members all in one crazy stuff. That's super uncommon. So in most instances, you'd be constrained to 12 or 13 meters long and 2.4 meters wide. Um, for us from Australia, we put them on car carriers. So we're not constrained to the uh, containers themselves. We can actually go as wide as we like, which is nice. Um, and then also just figuring out your route to your site, making sure that you can get the panel sizes that you're specifying actually on the roads, um, those sorts of things. It's just like, well, how do I figure that out? Get in touch with the suppliers. They'll have their contacts with the, the trucking companies who can figure it out very easily. Um, then on the assembly side, yep. On the assembly side, it's much the same as um, the, the manufacturer. Um, the bigger panels you've got, the less variability, the quicker, easier it'll be to, to build on site. Services coordination are a big one. While you can do big penetrations in glue lamp beams, can be expensive. There's some good tactics where you have a short bay um, as one of your bays, so a shallower beam and everything goes under. Um, we have a product, Fire Assess, that's coming out very shortly, CLT band beams. So they just replace your, your glue lamp beams and allow all these services to reticulate underneath. Um, if you need an argument against architects who are asking you to go to systems that aren't effective structurally, this is an awesome study that you can reference. Uh, they went through 350 projects in the US and they're all completed projects. So for me, as a bit of a natural selection of what 
um, are the characteristics that actually made it through to completion. And they've pulled out all these data points of what's happened. What they found was all but 4% of the projects were orthogonal or semi-orthogonal in shape. Um, in 3D, all but 3.4% were, were boxy. Um, and then all but 1% had linear grids. Um, and then, as I said, we always advocate best material for the, the best position. Out of all these jobs, only 22% um, only used timber. The rest had some sort of combination of steel and concrete. Um, I'm going to, should I wrap up there? Or should I? Probably like two minutes. All right, two minutes. Yeah, I haven't presented this stuff before, but this is kind of just quick thoughts on where I think the timber industry is going, which I, I mean, I think it's important to kind of, or for people our age to, to look into the future. Um, this is a, a paradigm that's used a bit of how new technology comes into market. So this graph on the left, um, older technology, I would put there as your concrete and your newer technology as your timber. There's often a step backwards as you introduce this material as people are getting used to it. Um, but as your efficiency increases, um, it can become better on any merits uh, or merits that you're interested in. So cost, speed, that sort of thing. I would argue we're very close to that overtaking point of concrete. Um, we're seeing the upswing. There's a lot more understanding out there. Um, so it's exciting times. Um, but I was trying to think about what I think will be the big change. I think most things that are on everyone's mind will be sorted out, the sort of fire, moisture, um, these sort of things, gut, uh, standards, designs. I think the fiber will become a bigger and bigger focus. So at the moment, we have less demand than uh, supply, um, which is great because, yeah, we can feed all these projects. But at some point, we're probably going to succeed or there's going to be more demand than supply. Um, that's great because hopefully that will encourage um, governments to plant more trees. In Australia, they've noticed this. They've announced a billion uh, trees programs. So they're going to plant a billion more trees by 2030. Um, so I think the sooner we can get to this point, the better. But after that, we're going to have to improve on um, other things, product efficiency, system efficiency, material circularity, um, product innovation, are kind of some areas. I won't go through them all, but you could research them if you want. Um, post and plate, I think, is a massive one to look out for. There's four buildings being built in the US at the moment where it's genuinely more cost competitive than concrete as a uh, method of construction for residential buildings. So I think there's going to be heaps of these coming up. Um, this is a scheme I've done. We can send around the slides. You can just do your own reading if you like. And then I think we're going to see way more of this material circularity. So starting with very high value products from the starting of the log, things like your mass timber, and then recycling those into uh, the lower value products down the chain. And then who knows, we could see a whole load of new weird wacky material uh, products coming out there. Bamboo, it's double the strength of pine. It grows in five to six years, soaks up more carbon than pine. Um, so who knows, maybe that'll be a material of the future. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure we have one plantation in Australia. Someone's uh, given it a crack. Mm, but I'll stop there. Thank you, everyone. You can go questions outside if you want to grab it. Yeah, quick questions. Sorry. You sort of started on it, but uh, is there enough trees in New Zealand for this? to grow for how long i don't have a good i've got a good understanding of the source coming in um from australia and yeah at the moment there's not enough demand for the supply that we have i yeah i personally think we need to get to that point to as soon as possible to drive more trees um and from their innovation i think we'll sort out a lot of that um keep in mind we're not trying to build every single building in the world out there out of timber um it's a portion of the market and yeah, if we can get to that, that's a positive change. Mm. Mm. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So that was going to be my point on the product innovation. Um, that might be where other products come into the market, which are quicker to grow. 
or you go to other things like reusing materials. So chipboard, CLT, um, which is almost as strong as CLT in that picture. So it could be from lower grade or smaller diameter um, trees or offcuts, um, branches, that sort of thing. What what is your like back following that question? What's your with the demand currently in the supply that you have? What how much fat do you have in the supply that you guys can provide? It's a little bit of a function of complexity. So if we're doing really complicated stuff, then the CNC might become our bottleneck, um, and that would limit how much we can do. But I mean, from the initial estimates of what when they bought um, XM, we might only be at 50% of what they were thinking we could do. But I think we're more likely maybe at like 70% of our full capacity if we were getting good, efficient, um, well-designed sort of uh, buildings. But then from there, you can always buy another CNC machine. You can always expand. Just something about CNC machine. Like uh, in hiking, 2009 and 2010, I was doing research on the timber at the University of Canterbury with Andy Buchanan and the other peoples. And at that time, there was a discussion to buy one CNC machine for this country, one CNC machine. And I remember well, there were some people that were saying, no, we don't need one CNC machine in New Zealand. Now I think we have around 10 CNC machines in the country. So you can see 2009, it's 15 years, 10 CNC machines that process the timber. This uh, industry has grown hugely, it's huge. And also on something that you started, uh, where, where we are going. Uh, I myself, after many years of working, I am thinking more or less, we won't go fully timber, at least in New Zealand for the, many of the project but we will likely to go to a uh, to a more composite area that we have a, a steel we have concrete we can get rid of concrete anytime soon and we have a timber and every part is playing their own their own fair bets yeah yeah 100 percent agree yeah right material for right spot Cool. Thank you, everyone. I'd just like to say a big thank you to Engineering New Zealand and to Nicola and Caitlin for hosting us this evening. Very appreciate that a lot. And to our three speakers, it's great to see you guys leading the way. Um, I'm sure we'll all go to work tomorrow inspired and do some sustainable design. Um, thank you very much.